I'm at a Black uh, Power rally in the uh, late 60s, and I'm with a friend who looks like he's a white guy, and they kind of try to throw him out of the meeting. And I don't stand up for him, you know, because I'm afraid of being on the outs with the Coke no Sinti, with the, with the Black rah-rah, you know, this kind of thing. And I think something like that happened to me in the 90s when I left my conservative moorings and veered left, that I was really, you know, at a, in a different way trying to appeal to the COVID nascente. I was trying to get the brothers to pat me on the back. I was trying to come home. You can't go home. You can't go home, you know, and I wanted the comfort, the warmth of, of this kind of uh, uh, unquestioned, you know, embrace of the folk. And uh, the conflict between that and the sense of integrity, of intellectual integrity, of courage, of vision, you know, stick with it, you know, because <laughs> when I read some of my essays from the 1980s, John, <laughs> when you were in college or whatever, <laughs> I say, that, God damn it, that guy was right. Why did he just stick to his guns? <laughs> and I know why I didn't stick to my guns. I, 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 I choked. I lost my nerve. I, I you know, I veered away Why? from the thing. You know, what, how, what, what made what made you choke? What was it? One thing? Uh, it was not one thing. I, you know, it was my uncle telling me that he didn't. You know, we could only send one. We sent you. We don't see us in anything you do. You know, this is my mother's brother. You know, he's in his late seventies now. You know, he, he's the patriarch. Uh, because I'm kind of estranged from the from the thing. Uh, it's the shame of you know coming out of this uh, terrible period in my life, you know, of uh, scandal and whatnot. And I, I kind of was a flawed being. I mean, I, I you know I, I wasn't confident within myself that I had standing with people. You know, I wanted I needed rehabilitation. Shelby Steele once said to me, and it was in front of a lot of other people, and so I don't, I don't think I'm telling tales out of school. He said this to me in 2001. Um, it was at a meeting, actually, that unfortunately didn't lead to anything. It was a lunch between him, me, Thomas Sowell, Walter Williams, and Larry Elder. We had lunch in, in Palo Alto. Wow, the that idea was story. That was his story. It was meant to be the beginning of something, but nothing Walter began. Walter Williams, Thomas Sowell, Larry Elder, Shelby Steele, John McWhorter. They, they, that's a conservative All thing. They were, were they trying to recruit room. you somehow? Yeah, um, I was honored to be included. Um, I think Thomas Sowell called it, and I was in the area then. And um, uh -huh. 2001. It didn't really take. Like, I think Tom was trying to reanimate the... Um, the movement that he had started in the early 1980s. Right. You, you, you were there, you know, and um, it didn't take, and I found myself thinking it's interesting to go against this orthodoxy that, for example, you were moved to try to rejoin for a bit. The power of that orthodoxy is such. And to go against it, you have to be somebody who really marches to your own beat. And maybe you're too much of a one-man band to join gracefully together with other people. I felt like we were five individuals in the room, but there was not the group feeling that there needed to be somehow. It just, it didn't, it didn't take, or maybe it was just the wrong five people. But Shelby said something to me that really struck. I was kind of disappointed. I was sympathetic. I was struck. He said that at some point in his trajectory after his book, The Content of Our Character, he had started to question himself. He had started to wonder whether he was just wrong because of the volume of the criticism against him. And then he snapped back. But I remember thinking, wow, is it that bad? You know, and I had only been doing it for a couple of years at the time, but I thought, are they gonna hit you so hard that you start doubting yourself? So I, I know what you mean about that. You want the warmth back. Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. And I probably make some compromises in that direction myself. There are things I don't say. There are things that I say more gingerly than I might really feel. I don't, I, I don't think I'm going to undergo any great transformations. But yeah, I can't help but feel kind of lonely sometimes. But um, it's, it's, it's interesting that people go through that. It occurs to me, I say this, and she's no longer around to hear it, Abigail Thurston. 
that she actually saw what was happening to me in the 90s, which was that I was losing my, my nerve and the, the courage of my conviction, saw the tragedy in that because my voice, you know, meant something. And um, that her, her sense of injury wasn't only the fact that I wrote a negative review of their book, but it was a, a deeper disappointment in the loss, as she might have put it. You know, Norman Pothorid said something like this to me too. This is the longtime editor of Commentary Magazine, publisher. Um, yeah, because I used to talk about the loyalty trap. You know, you feel loyal to the race, and so you don't say what you think in critical observation about what's going on with the race. And he says, I didn't just fall into it, I leaped with both feet into the loyalty trap. <laughs> and I just poo-pooed that, I just blew that off. I said, oh, that's just sour grapes, man. You know, you just, you know, I'm, I'm no longer your, your boy. I, you know, I'm no longer on the reservation. I'm no longer your reliable conservative black voice to back your play. And you're just, you're just mad about, about that. But he might've had a point I did, you know. I went through some of that with Abby, actually. Um, she was, one of the very, very first people when I wrote my first, quote unquote, contrarian piece about race, which appeared in the Wall Street Journal. The Times took it, but then destroyed it, completely changed everything I was saying. It didn't sound anything like me and then, and then spiked it, which at the time was very disappointing because I hadn't been through that sort of thing yet. Then Sam Tannenhaus was nice enough to get it taken up by the Wall Street Journal. I owe a lot of my career just to that move that he made. And it appeared, I honestly now don't remember what I said, but Abby was one of the Abby. first people who wrote me and she kind of welcomed me into the fold. And early on, she said, don't be afraid to be a Republican. You'll have lots of friends in, in, the, in the party who will embrace you. There are many people like us, lapsed liberals, you know, you, you are a Republican at heart. Don't be afraid to do And I never did that. And more to the point, I started, you know, criticizing some of the excesses of the right-wing take on race by the mid-aughts. And Abby and I never had any kind of falling out, but it had, it had been. I had Abby and Steve over to dinner at my place back then. I invited them to my wedding um, back then. They couldn't make wow. it. But I, they were people who I would have invited, who I would have had there. Lovely. But, yeah, it, but then it may have been part of the reason they weren't at the wedding was that Abby and probably both of them were getting kind of disappointed in me because I wasn't going to be a movement Republican conservative writer. 